You are watching live on KEXP at home. I'm honored to be here today with the pioneer, the legend, Leraji. How are you doing today? I'm doing infinitely nice and grateful. Wonderful. As am I. Thank you so much for sharing your time, uh, your inspiration and, and, and spontaneity. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure we can get right into the sounds and the vibration. So let's get into it. All right. Live on KEXP at home, La Raji. Beautiful. Take two, Mizell Laraji.
ओम शांति That's live on KEXP with La Raji right here on KEXP, beaming live from Harlem, New York. This fantastic vibration you've shared with us. Thank mm. you so much. I was hoping you could tell us about your the instruments you're using. Um, the variety of instruments I'm working with these days: synthesizer. Acoustic piano, grand piano, electric open tune zither harp, a 36 string instrument, originally called a sitara, from up from Africa through Austria and Germany into Canada and down into the United States. Uh, I mentioned that instrument particularly because it's the one that I took as my special experimental project in the 1970s. Uh, a very portable instrument that could be electrified, and I could perform from uh, altered states or in a yoga postures. So I was communicating uh, transcendental kind of mental states through this improvisational music with mainly this electrified auto harp, generally in the areas like Brooklyn parks and New York City parks and museum areas. Uh, it's just recently that I was able to return to the piano as a feature recording experience for Warp All Saint Records uh, about two years ago. Sun Piano and Moon Piano, the, they are, as I mentioned earlier, all improvisation, but, uh, but with celest celestial structure, meaning... Uh, the idea is more of a therapeutic instrument, I think, of piano. can be used to uh, stimulate, to uh, provide a therapeutic listening and feeling experience for the listener. And so with sun piano, especially sun piano, more radiant, uplifting, joyful, positive mood as the uh, intention of the, of the improvisation. It's as if working on a client instead of with my hands, working with an instrument. And moon piano is more of a relaxed, laid-back, maybe a sensually feminine, uh, contemplative mood. There again, to uh, offer the listener a sonic space within which to chill or do whatever they want to do with a quieted environmental influence. Beautiful. They're, they're fantastic records. I'm astounded by the it is, depth and, and the that, breadth of your catalog. Yeah, I, I think of it as fantastic too, because usually when I listen back to the music, I say, fantastic. <laughs> because You're a surprise I don't remember anybody. what I do until I listen to it. That's one of my favorite things about a lot of the creators I know, when they really get into the flow. Yes. And they come out of it, and I, I'm like sharing with them my impressions mm -hmm. and, and how blown away I am. And they're like, I did that, or I said that? Wow. It's yeah, a beautiful that thing, that a, connection. Quite a unique experience. Uh, I know that some producers and performers, recording artists, like to leave maybe as much as a few weeks between the performance and the playback so that they can really listen and objectively and well technically if i'm doing music with that intention of it being a therapeutic listening experience i get the benefit of that as well when i'm listening mm -hmm. back and you as a musician get the benefit of your music i could say a little thing about the piano was my first real serious instrument and it started out in a church, a Baptist church in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, when I was probably at the age of uh, seven, eight. And uh, my mother saw my interest, the way I would uh, improvise on the piano at the basement of the church during, uh, in between services, I would have this quiet time to myself. And so my mother noticed that and she invested in the piano placed the piano in the house, an upright piano. And she uh, sponsored me for 
lessons, piano lessons. And so there she was giving me the gift of my heart's desire to immerse myself in the musical experience and to become a conscious navigator in the world of musical sound. I, I heard a story you told about how you first encountered the auto harp. Yes. I'd say this, it was the second time. The first time I encountered it, it was a distance experience of just viewing it while I was doing my, during the years I was doing stand-up comedy in Greenwich Village. And uh, comedians were sequenced in between other acts. And some of those acts were like a Kentucky bluegrass ensemble. I remember viewing them while I was off stage waiting for my turn. And I saw the auto harp or the zither, and it was used very gently as part of the whole Kentucky bluegrass music scene. You know, there's I think I have the banjo, guitar, a drummer, bass player, and then this auto harp. And I later found out that it's also used in the Appalachian Mountains of uh, here in the East. And so the so I hadn't touched the instrument. I just it would be in the back of my mind. And so this event you're talking about was one day while living in Queens, New York, I was doing uh, electric piano, Fender Rhodes piano for a group called Winds of Change. And so the piano was my major instrument at the time. And I was, I had a guitar that I hung out with. And the guitar I wasn't using much, so I decided to take it into town and pawn it. And uh, as I was going into the pawn shop, I noticed that instrument, the auto harp zither, in the window. And I said to myself, hmm, there's that interesting instrument. And that's all I did. And then I walked into the pawn shop to pawn my uh, six-string Yamaha guitar in a fiberglass Martin's case. And I thought it would be worth at least $175. And the clerk offered me $25. And I said, whoa, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work. Because I needed money. And so uh, I looked back at the window, and this voice came in. And an intuitive guidance came through. It says, swap your guitar for the instrument in the window. And I thought to myself, hey, that's way out. <laughs> way out. And I was even more impressed with how this communication was coming through, as if it was a clear voice. It was and a very like a cosmic grandparent, a loving cosmic grandparent, or an extraterrestrial loving force, just saying, swap it. And I could feel all that love and wisdom in that voice. And so I was curious to see where this would go if I followed that voice, or following that voice would allow me to stay connected to it. So I swapped it for the auto harp in the window, plus $5. I made a little deal on the side. And then I left with the auto harp, not knowing what I was going to do with it, but I felt just holding the auto harp, I was this in this intimate communion with this unclear voice, this wisdom, this guidance. And there was like a cosmic comfort that came all over my body, my cells, just thing, hey, I'm in conscious communion with some, some uh, transcendental <laughs> force. And... Uh, so that inspired me to explore the auto harp as an open tune instrument. I eventually took the chord bars off. If anyone knows what the auto harp is, it's a zither, this corded zither with a housing mechanism on it for cording the instrument as though you were your fingers. But I removed that in order to have access to the entire string board. And then I put it in some of my favorite guitar open tunings and I would hang out with the instrument. I should say that by this time in my life, I had uh, been practicing deep meditation for long hours. So I was contacting a very deep foundation of peace that pervades the universe. And, uh, and so that inner experience, I, could, I would talk about it to my friends, but it didn't make sense to them what I was talking about. But when I got into letting it kind of direct my musical performance experience, then I could see in people's bodies and body language that they were getting what I couldn't put in words. Their own physical body would relax. And I'd play like at the zoo at Central Park, though there was a wide uh, 
assortment of people from around the world who would pass through this zoo. And after I'd performed, they would tell me their experience as it would relate to an instrument that was in their country, you know. So, and sometimes there were religious experiences people were having. And I thought, yeah, I don't mind doing this for a while and staying out of trouble with this kind of, this kind of uh, lifestyle. So I, I began getting invitations to um, conferences, New Age conferences, meditation groups, yoga centers who were opening wanted me to come by and offer my music to help to bless the opening of their yoga centers. And then I got to, uh, eventually, my default performance space was Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village in New York, usually in the late 70s. And that's where I was experimenting with these open tunings and altered states of consciousness. And I found out that it helped, or it gave people a very different opportunity to relax, to sit and just chill. And on one of those particular evenings in Washington Square Park, after playing and counting my money, <laughs> um, I received a note from Brian Eno inviting me to collaborate on his project, which turned out to be the Ambient 3, Day of Radiance. On that album, it was my second vinyl, but it allowed me to uh, receive more global attention, which led eventually to global traveling. So the Zither Auto Harp, it's got several names, was responsible for my getting to share this transcendentally inspired musical intention uh, in remote places, places where I couldn't pick, take a piano. And uh, some of the gigs that I got last summers were in festivals, like in the mountains of uh, Bulgaria. And, then, and then I, I couldn't see myself carrying a piano <laughs> to that location. <laughs> but thank goodness the zither was very, very uh, uncomplicated to set up and through speakers, you know, radiate a very luscious, uh, enveloping sound. So there's the short version of my answer. Right on. Thank you. Well, what a blessing. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm so grateful that you heeded that voice and then yes. it spoke and it brought you to that instrument. It sounds like you are familiar with that voice. <laughs> I, I, I like to think I am sometimes. Sometimes I, I wonder. Um, yes, it was a lesson, a lesson to how to trust, how to recognize this inner guidance and to follow it. And, uh, and uh, people who approach me asking about inner guidance, inner voice, and I say, you might experiment with it. You might go to a park, your favorite park, when you have a whole day to yourself, and stand at the entrance of the park and just say to yourself, which way should I go? And just listen to what you think you heard, and experiment with what you think you heard, and you get to another place, which way should I go? What should I do now? And listen, and just follow what you think you heard. Get better at following what you think you heard, and what happens in that safe experience is you learn that you don't, you don't perish, you don't, uh, that good, th gentle things happen. You learn how to feel comfortable following the inner voice. And in my cases, I would use it by stand on the street corner in New York with my instruments. Is where should I go play? And I'd get a voice, and say, go three blocks down, and, and I'd find this that I would never think of getting to myself and sit down and play and have the most fantastic income, the most fantastic meeting of people. And, uh, so I learned that following the voice is an equation for getting to good things to happen in your life. Hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to touch on some of the work you've been doing with... Um, your, your laughter meditation workshops. Yes, that's uh, one of my favorite subjects is laughter 
watching people lose it through laughter. Ever since I was a child, growing up in a semi-rough neighborhood, and I found that the ability to keep your, your uh, fellow uh, residents in a harmless place is to <laughs> get them to laugh. But uh, somewhere in 1998, 1990, 1980, 1980, was uh, just after I'd done about 10 years of stand-up comedy, film comedy. And uh, I decided that doing stand-up comedy was not where I really wanted to go with my life because at that time it involved the thought of being in smoke-filled late hours around. Uh, and, and also I was... Starting to get, I was getting into meditation and understanding how consciousness works, and that uh, that we can unconsciously create a life for ourselves that we don't don't really want. And I was getting it that the material that I was using, the approach I was using to uh, entertain, was actually setting up currents inside myself to create a life later on that I wouldn't really want to be a part of. So. I kind of subdued the comedy for a while until 1980 and someone introduced me to how you can laugh without polarizing an audience. And you can do something called laughter meditation. So you can get deeper into the, the beneficial, the health uh, benefits of laughter without necessarily using jokes. And I said, hmm, let me try this. So it was a a teacher at the time, uh, a mentor, a person whose teachings was very stimulating to me at the time. His name was uh, Rajneesh, Osho Bhagwan Rajneesh. And so his followers put out a book called The Book of Orange Meditations. And in that book of orange meditations, there was on one page the suggestion of a laughter meditation. And then the first time I ever heard the words laughter and meditation used in the same phrase, and I said, Whoa. And that in itself was a, a healing to actually begin to relate to uh, meditation as a lighter, uh, joy filled experience. And so the directions were for one week before getting out of bed, lay there with your eyes closed and laugh for 15 minutes. And I tried that, and I was so impressed, and I never really laughed lying down. I noticed how ready I was to support other people's laughter during the course of the day, and also how much more of my authentic laughter was available, even though if I was faking more of it in the morning. So it developed into my sharing it as a workshop, the laughter work you speak of, from a five-minute introduction to a, sometimes a three-hour-long laughter release journey in which I get the in, the participants to open up with call and response chanting, uh, chanting of some traditional, non-traditional, spiritual, inspirational chants, and sometimes light language. Then we go into uh, six or seven different laughter exercises. Uh, for one, for instance, there's a certain laughter that you can use to stimulate the pituitary in the brain, and uh, it's just bringing your tone of your voice up to your third eye. Mm. <laughs> now, see, I don't advise you do these in the middle of a, uh, an airport terminal. You do these on your own. You just focus your breath and your voice inwardly. And in order to play with it, the laughter work involves playfulness. And we share our definition of playfulness is play is the spontaneous exploration of sensation. Play is the spontaneous exploration of sensation. So we play with our laughter, the sensation of vibrating and stimulating the pituitary, your thyroid, your thymus your abdominal organs, your heart, and your lungs. And for uh, about half an hour, we go through all these exercises in the laughter work, and then the individuals have the opportunity to lie down and invent their own laughter release. 
and in a way that they might use it in the morning before getting out of bed, or if you're a musician, in the afternoon before getting out of bed. So you explore your laughter, and then we let the participants go into deep relaxation and meditation. For laughter is a total release, sort of like shavasana or corpse pose in a yoga class. Your body is relaxed, the muscles are relaxed, your mind is relaxed from intense thought flow, your breath is relaxed, and you're in the best place for spontaneous meditation awareness, becoming aware of yourself, uh, just permeated with a meditative reality, that you're in a space of natural meditation. And then we use, sometimes I work with a uh, partner, R.G. Osiananda, and we move around the room with instruments to help to complement that deeper state of relaxation that some of the participants have never gotten to before on their own. And some of them are very familiar with it, this deep relaxed place. And we use the gong, use the zither, use voice, use African thumb piano. And then we allow a place of just deep silence to follow all of that, and then we get all the participants into the body again with a, a happy foot song. It's a playful song to be sure everyone is grounded in the body after a long meditative journey. And so that experience can take anywhere from 20 minutes to two or three hours, depending on the nature of the, uh, the event. And that's, there's the laughter work. And I get to enjoy it with wonderful hours, there's different hours from nightclub, and you get to present these workshops in a circle, so everyone's, there's no hierarchy of a stage and an audience. In some cases there are, but mostly it's, we're in a circle, and we're connected, and it's a warm, loving, heart-centered experience. That's astounding, and... Uh... It was such a revelation hearing, just hearing about this practice, and then later on, hearing about your background in comedy and acting, finding out that you were in Putney Swope. What a fantastic classic film. And uh, then by happenstance, having a conversation with my father one day, and he yeah. said, oh yeah, I used to go out Loraji, he'd do comedy, I'd play the piano. Well, you know, at night while he was doing his, his engineer thing during the day. And I was like, what, you know, Laraji that, that, that blew me away. And, uh, it just, yes, we used to hang out in the Howard university practice rooms together. And, uh, and that, uh, jamming and, uh, energy followed us when we, uh, moved, moved from college back to our, he was living in Jersey, and I lived in New York, and we got together and wrote some songs that got produced, and Donald Byrd and the Blackbirds and a few other artists, Marvin Gaye. Oh, wow. Right on. Okay. Uh, what's, what songs are those? I'm curious. Where Are We Going? Is one oh, of that's one of my women favorites. Women of the World. Yeah. And uh, those are the two major ones. Those came and, out uh, fairly recently after being shelved on, on the Marvin Gaye posthumous album that came out a couple years ago. Uh, was that a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> those, uh, those, those two songs just came out fairly recently um, on that posthumous Marvin album. And those are two of my favorites um, that, you know, I'd had for years, even before they'd, they'd come out commercially. So I'm, that's astounding, astounding that you were a part of that. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Love it. Well, your father's been pretty prolific. Uh, he's done things I'm not even aware of. I had a lot of time to do it in. Yeah, he's he's been doing a lot of work for a long time, mm -hmm. including you. Your piece of work. Yeah, I'm one of, <laughs> I'm, one of I'm one of his 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 works for sure. I always reflect on how I kind of came out of a really fruitful period for him, and mm. I've always been such a, I appreciated so much of the work you created then. And I was just like, well, I'm one of those things. That's pretty cool to know. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your voice and uh, your inspiration, your process, and your vibration with us via KEXP. I hope one day 
um, to see you here in Seattle. Yes. Maybe get you in this likely. live room. Doing the, uh, I tend to wind up in Seattle at least once a year. And, uh, we'll see how it goes 2021. In the Good Shepherd Church. I've heard of it. Yeah, I think we performed there once not too okay. long ago. Right on. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time. You're so welcome, Larry. Appreciate it. It's been a joy to communicate with you. It's a unique pleasure. Absolutely. Well, this has been live on KXP at home with Laraji. Home peace.